this, man. I like this group. What? What? Dispatches from Planet Funk. This is the Ace Out Podcast. Dedicated to all whom the man tried to ace out by profiting from the soul without stopping to give props to the prophets of soul. Hmm. Can you dig that? My name is Ace Allen. Some people call me Barack Wayne. And we're brought to you by the letter P. And we're sponsored by Pete. P E T E. Otherwise called. People for the ethical treatment of ear holes. Everybody around me is Funk and Not Fam affiliated. Because Funk is just fun with a K. That's why they pronounce it Funky. Would you agree with that, Jay? Yeah, buddy. Oh, my goodness. I'm not even going to talk to you, man. I have nothing to say to you right now because <laughs> the woman is here. Yes. This is who we need to pay attention to. Chocolate. That was is that really chocolate? That's her, man. Is this Patrice Banks? Is that her funk box? <laughs> right there? <laughs> Sitting next to you? That's it. Oh, my God. I thought I was going to get sit- to sit next to the funk box. Yeah, How come you get to sit next to it, man? Because... I'm That's jealous. right. Go, oh, yeah, because you guys are cousins. <laughs> so you guys are family, right? You are related? Yes, sir. All right. Yes. All right. And um, I've been anticipating this for weeks. Um, I'm so excited. This is a really important episode, and I'm really glad to bring this episode to all of you because you are going to dig it, and we've got some serious school to take you to. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is really important. So first of all, let me break this all down. So, um... This is part of our series of having guests back on who have meant a lot to Ace Out Podcast and really took a chance on us, especially in the first year of our show yeah. when we were an all audio telephone show back in the old days, Jay Stone. Yeah, revisiting. And yeah, so we're going to revisit. And I've been wanting to have Chocolate out. Uh, she came out here from Southern Cal with her husband, uh, Don. And uh, it's so great to have her here. Sorry it's been kind of a hot one this week. It was really warm, but it cooled off finally. Um, you know, this is going to be one of the most important guests that we've ever had, you guys. Um, this is one of the most significant figures in funk history sitting right next to us on this purple couch, okay? Um, she's musically talented, but she's also so full of wisdom. She brings the truth with no chaser, Jay Stone. Um, she's kind, but assertive person. Uh, she often thinks of others before she thinks of herself, yep. um, and we'll talk about that. Um, and she handles herself quite well. She knows how to get down. And having her here, it's not only fun because we're friends and we're family, but it's also an honor. And I just want to make sure everybody understands that. Check it. And we're doing you guys a favor right now by talking to her right now, okay? So you're about to get some school, and you're welcome in advance. <laughs> so, um, look... We're talking about Graham Central Station, okay? Graham Central Station. One of the baddest, most important bands in all of funk history. Yes, sir. Grew up from right here in California in the Bay Area. And uh, we're talking about, of course, the bassist Larry Graham, who came up in the Sly and the Family Stone camp. One of my personal favorites, of course, so many others. Somebody I've tried, tried to emulate on bass. And uh, I'm talking about the OG band. I'm talking about the band with Chocolate, with Willie Wilde on drums. I'm talking about with Butch. I'm talking about Herschel Happiness and David Dynamite. Yes. And uh, wow, I mean, this is the group. And their first four albums are must-haves. Just ooey, gooey, churchy, badass, rockin'. Super duper funk, okay? Wow, and it's just all school and it's all fun. I'm talking about the self titled debut, came out in 73. Next year, um, Release Yourself came out. Ain't no doubt it about it. And then she was also on Mirror. You know what? Chocolate also toured with such artists as Stephanie Mills, Shaka Khan, BB King. Mm-hmm. She's worked a lot. She likes to work with Wayne Henderson. She was also a member of Rose Royce for a while. A lot of people don't know that. Um, 
She even did a little bit of that funky flute with Dr. Dre back in the day. She had kind of a funny meeting with uh, Easy E. I think she thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> um, and uh, this is her third appearance on the show, actually. Uh, she's been on three times, so let me talk to you about that, because this is part of why she's so significant to us and why we love her so much. So back in 2020, way back in 2020, right when the pandemic hit, uh, Jay Stone, mm -hmm. Um, well, I guess you were doing the Funk for Our Lives um, charity, right? Right. And uh, so, kind of through that, I guess you started. How did it go? You started talking to her about Ace Out Podcast because she called me. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, because it was so cool <laughs> around that time. Oh. <laughs> All right, we'll work on that rehearsal later. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. I'm just trying to remember because actually what I'm trying to say is, yeah. um, unfortunately, uh, the great Willie Wilde passed away also around that same time. Yeah, that time when yeah. that, uh, Right when that. that Funk for Our Lives was happening, it was around the same time. Yeah. And that was a bummer. That really, really was a bummer because it was just when the pandemic hit as well. So people couldn't really check on each other or really convene. Right. And also, Willie was, you know, he wasn't having a great life. He was struggling, having some problems towards the end there. As we do. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I was just talking about how much he was an influence on me, how much I admire him. Yeah. But I do remember that a man by the name of Larry G was not really around to help with the um, remembrance of this man, okay. who was the original drummer of this funk band. Yeah, yeah. However, who did get on the hotline and called the bat phone was chocolate over here. Uh -huh. And so she uh, she approached us because she heard about the podcast Word. through you. Yeah, yeah. And because uh, you're all cousins. And then she asked, she requested if she could use the podcast as a vehicle where we mm -hmm. could pay tribute to Willie Wilde. And I was like, oh my God, yes. You yeah. know, it was like an honor. So basically what we did is we co-hosted um, she and I, she co-produced, she actually got all the guests that we talked to on that episode, uh, including Rusty Allen, who's yeah. going to be on next month. And uh, we did that episode together. You guys, please check that out, by the way. That's Willy Wild, episode 10. And that episode was deep for some people. We, we put that together kind of last minute, a little bit more of a scramble, but it really came out cool in the end. And it was an honor to do that. And while I had her, I was like, well, gosh, we should just do an episode on you, <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. Now that I connected with her and we made friends. So the following episode, episode 11, one of our best episodes, in my opinion, is uh, with chocolate. Right. And that is in, I think we did that the summer of 2020. Uh, so thank you so much and welcome back, Chocolate. Um, we're going to be talking to her about all kinds of stuff. I just want to make sure I point a couple of things out. She is a published author. I'm going to be asking her questions, a lot of them based off of this fantastic book right here, Deja Vu. This has got to be made into a movie or HBO yeah, series, man. I think. So I'm many adventures. You. Oh, my God. <laughs> so please much. read that book. <laughs> please. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it's just something else. Um, and she, that's not the only book that she's done. She also has A Chocolate State of Mind, uh, which has poetry and short stories, mm -hmm. and Secret Sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, Chocolate also has a clothing line. She does this with Stozo, right? Right. And uh, she has fantastic, fantastic stuff on One Stop Funk Shop. Go there. This is an example of just one of many great shirts. Look at this. People Look know this Stozo detail. from P Funk, right? Mm -hmm. What's that? People know Stozo's art. From People P -Funk. know Stozo mm -hmm. from P Funk. He was right. actually on the Tales from the Tour bus that Mike Judge show. Yes, he was, they yeah, featured was. him on that. You see him in concert or whatever. He's got a little nose, <laughs> red nose. Stozo he's like, the clown. <laughs> Stozo the clown. Mm -hmm. and, and you guys, uh, it's, it's just called Chocolate Clown, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. And I love it so much. Last but certainly not least, and we touched on it already, you might see that the funk box is perched right here. Well, why would that be here? Are we just going to look at it? No. We're going to get down. We're going to play and the Funkonauts are going to back up Chocolate, and we're not going to play one song. We're going to play two songs. We're going to play two songs with Chocolate. That's right. And boy, oh boy, um, we got Osha here, and we got Randy G, and we're going to meet them and talk to them a little bit when they come out, and we're going to get down with that. Um, okay, I just want to thank, uh, real quick before we get started, I want to thank uh, JW. Uh, episode 26 we love you jw yes sir and um very successful episode everybody loved the song and how it went <clears throat> i know he had a really good time 
<laughs> and uh, thank you so much, JW. And uh, we love you, man. And we got great feedback on that. Um, Jay, you've been playing with uh, Femi. Uh, you did a gig with uh, Punk Funk Mob, so that was cool. Yeah, man, that was cool. It was at the Band Shell uh, in Golden Gate Park, built in like 1800, 1872. Yeah, I saw some footage from you that. Know, it looked really, yeah, uh, it really it was, cool. It so cool, uh, like shout some... out to Femi as well. Yes, sir. Um, next episode, we're going to have Rusty Allen here. Rusty. Rusty's going to perform, so that's going to be good. Yeah. And I might be able to just relax and watch this time, you know, okay. not have pressure for me to perform. Now I have to be like, not Larry Graham today. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's going to say, he's not Larry Graham. She's chocolate, but that's not Larry Graham. He's too short and light skinned. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's all right. I'll do my best. Also coming up, we have our boy Steve Pinnell. Oh, yeah. Funkadelic, electric spanking award, baby. Shout mm -hmm. out to Pure Fine at Funk Insurance. He's going to come out here. Maybe we could play with him. You know. Um, we're going to have Janice Marie Johnson, the bassist from the R&B duo Taste of Honey. That's Boogie, right. Oogie, oogie. That's right. I don't know if you guys know, when you heard that song, you might have thought they were just singing. She actually is the bass player and the singer of that song. And the singing lead and guitar, that burning guitar, that's also a lady on guitar mm -hmm. singing the backup vocals. And they're going to be on the show as well. And you hooked that up, Jay. You know. Can you tell me about how you hooked that up? Are you going to keep that a secret, too? Uh friend you know just friends of friends and man, this guy's so mysterious people, man people have been coming up to me and be like no i know i know the podcast you do and whatnot oh yeah you said somebody yeah. uh recognized you the other man, day huh twice at the coffee shop in santa cruz <laughs> harvey and uh patrick are here flex was here earlier so shout out to him but harvey and patrick are holding it down on the film getting my good side how do my nose hairs look they look good i i, I you know i decorated them earlier <laughs> Oh, by the way, thanks to Richard Segovia for hooking us up with these gentlemen. Right on, Richard Segovia. Richard, I don't know if you remember Richard Chocolate, but he was in a group called Mabuhai back in the 70s who actually got to open for Graham Central, like when you guys were at the Soul Train Club, uh, he mentioned uh, okay. uh, way back when. So actually, so uh, Richard's a cat that we love. Yeah, he has the Casa Bandito. He's a Latin rock uh, timbali player who's mm -hmm. also a friend of the show. We have so many friends I'm of the sure show you know. and so many people helping us. Mm -hmm. Uh, so thank you so much. I shouted out uh, uh, Chocolate's husband, Donald, who's here in the room with us. Mm -hmm. Scott is here as well. We don't want to forget the post-production crew. They're not here, but we're still going to think about them. Shout out to Nick Ways. Shout out to uh, Three Charts. Go to aceoutpodcast.com. That's aceoutpodcast.com. Go to funkinots.com. Wow. I'm getting down to this jade. Jay Stone score, man. It's funky. I like that little <laughs> part you put in. Um, check out our album, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Our theme song is I Can Never Be from that album. But do me a favor, guys. I'm going to ask you two favors. First one is please like and subscribe our channel. Yes, please. Please do that. Hit that love button. But you know what else somebody pointed out to me? It's not good enough to do that, Jay Stone. Uh -huh. We need to encourage people to Shame. interact with it. So drop us some comment when you watch the video. Like, tell yeah. us what you think about it. You know what I mean? Tell us which one you think is handsome and which one is not. I already know what the answer is, but, you know, just let Jay know. So. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Okay. First thing I want to talk to you about, and thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. Um, I don't want to, you know, I want everybody to look at that. I mean, listen to that episode, episode 11. We talked about a lot of great stuff from the book. I don't want to rehash literally everything from that, but we do want to set the table because we might have new listener, new, new viewers checking out for the first time and you might be getting that impression for the first time. And I was talking to Osha about this before. So hot chocolate, let's start there. Okay. What was the group hot chocolate? You just tell us. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is very important work that you and my cousin over here are doing. And Scott, very important work. So, you know, keeping that funk alive, to me, there's no more of an important mission. You know what I'm saying? Because that's my mission also, to keep the funk alive you know it, yeah. until the wheels fall off. You know yeah, that, right? right? Okay. You write so, hard. So, hot chocolate. Um, Where to begin? So, I was with Larry. Um, we were a couple. He was still with Sly and the he Family Stone. Sly, yeah. mm -hmm. And so I was traveling on the road with him. 
And in the meantime, he was producing my group, my little group we had. All the members of Grand Central Station were in it, except for the bass player. His name was Paul Jones. Paul Jones. Mm -hmm. So um, after Larry left Sly, he joined Hot Chocolate, and it became Grand Central Station. By the way, I wanted to ask you about that. What did you think about that name change? Were you with that, or were you like, huh? Yeah, I, Yeah, I was with it. I was with it because... You know, I, how could you go wrong with having Larry Graham in the group? You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I was with it. I, You know, I think it was even my idea maybe a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So um, it was good. I liked it. What What was the first material, kind of material you were doing in Hot Chocolate? Was it originals from the beginning or just kind of like jamming or like what was it? Covers, were you making? We would, we would yeah. do covers and rearrange them. I was doing, uh, in, in particular, I was doing the song uh, Dear... Prudence by the Beatles. Right, Yeah, right. so we were doing stuff like that and right. rearranged it, and which we kept that song when Grand Central Station started, and it became Priscilla. Priscilla. Yeah, I love yeah, that one. Which Beautiful. was my really my best friend. Yeah, you, you mentioned her before. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's what, who that was about. Mm -hmm. And I love that version. Uh, what about um, like gigging? I can't remember. Did you guys, as Hot Chocolate under that name, did you ever like, were you just like working the material out first? Or yeah, were you we were working gigs? the material. And we did actually do a couple of gigs, but we didn't really do a lot because we were just getting started. And then Larry left the group. And so we didn't do very many gigs. Did you rehearse at the house? You were at the house with Larry's mom, right? Um, grandmother. Oh yeah, grandmother, mm -hmm. grandmother. Sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Did you rehearse there or? Mm -hmm. we, there, there was a room right. that was designated as the music room. So <laughs> one that's, of those funky music rooms. So, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so we did most of our rehearsing there until the neighbors started calling the police. Mm -hmm. So then we had to move it to a warehouse uh, in Oakland. Wow. Did Willie uh, Willie Wilde have to audition, or was he just kind of known in the cut, or how did he come into the? No, mix? he didn't have to audition because because uh, it was Greg Rico kind of at first, but he wasn't really serious, mm -hmm. right? Well, yeah, he was serious, but oh. you know they they just you know sometimes you have a bunch of egos in one room that doesn't work. So Greg wanted to do something different. Also, Neil Sean Neil Sean was there wanted to do something yeah. different. So. Um, Herschel was in the group, and Willie was a friend of Herschel's. Willie and Herschel, and a brother named David Stalins mm -hmm. and Rusty, they all uh, went oh, to school Rusty. together. Okay. So they all, it was, it was a clique of them, you know what I'm saying? So they all shared information. They all, they did all the gigs in Oakland. Wow. Mm hmm So that's how he, Willie didn't have, Willie had been playing, I think, a little bit with Sly before he joined the group. So, no, he didn't have to audition. Larry already knew what he could do. I wondered about that. You guys, was it a, in Fremont that you had like a warehouse that was almost, that you'd practice there, but it was like an informal club? Where was that like warehouse you guys used to practice? It was in, I, believe, I don't think it was in Fremont. I think it, it was, was in Oakland. That was a long it was, time okay, ago. It was in Oakland. Yeah, okay. I think it was in Oakland. I might have got it wrong for And me. what happened was we would rehearse all the time, like all the time, almost every night. I'm jealous so, of that, man. So, you hear that? Uh, People yeah. started hearing about our rehearsals and they right. started and then they started coming to our rehearsals. They started dressing up, so it made us have to dress up and before you <laughs> dressing knew it. up for rehearsals. That's so yeah, it was cool, a show. Man. A oh free show every night. Wow. And we were just getting tighter and tighter and tighter. How so. many people would how many people would be there? Sometimes it would be like up seriously up to like because it was not much bigger than this room. Sometimes it would be 10 to 15 people in there just coming to hear us rehearse. Was it cool? Would people be cool? Yeah. Okay. They, they were mostly friends and, you know, people mm -hmm. we knew, relatives and stuff, and other musicians. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, Raphael Sadiq. Yeah, Tony he, Tony. he told a story uh, once that he um, used to go. He was a, a little boy. He used to ride his bike up to the rehearsal hall and, and stay outside and listen to us. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's so cool, man. Yeah. That's all school. He was a Graham Central Station fan. I'm jealous of that as well. I think um, we talked to Juan Escovito a couple, I think he did that a couple of times as well. Some people from his family, because they were growing up in Oakland yeah. at the mm -hmm. time. Um, there's one, and by the way, if you guys, I want to say it again, uh, Deja Vu. Um, if you're a funk fan, if you like funk, this is like, this is like main ingredients. This is stuff you have to have. This isn't like just kind of some kind of side stuff. You know, when people talk about the funk, this all, you know, P-Funk, 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 and we love that P-Funk. 
or you're talking about Sly, 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 you know, we love Sly or, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. But you really, Graham Central Station is the thing. And, um, you know, people write books, but she can write a book. And I, I even compared her to Richard Pryor. Remember that? Because yeah. just the way she tells a story, there's pain in her life. There's tough stuff, but it's not like, um, I don't know. The way she talks about it is like, she, there's a sense of humor to it. Um, it's very insightful and it's fun to read and it's a good story. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's just well, I love it so much. Um, I want to this time. I want to share just a couple of quotes from the book and talk to talk to the people about it and talk to you. Uh, one quote I like here on page one eighty seven. This is talking about uh, leading a band, uh, leading an organization. I thought this was interesting. You say that Sly was the coolest band leader in my music career. He taught me things that still serve me well to this day about running a band and treating people right. Larry never got that lesson. Hiding behind a religious cult organization won't erase the damage done by the greed and insecurity shown on his part. I learned for free how not to treat people who work for your organization by how horrible he could treat folks sometimes. You also throw in at the end um, as sort of like a specific example Willie and Herschel never really got any credit for their contributions to songs, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, let's pull back. So the, the band leading styles, will you talk to us a little bit about that? Because I think that's so important, even for nowadays, just like leading organizations and musical organizations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, Sly was, even though he got um, involved in all the things he got involved in, mostly the drugs. Um, so what took him away right. from the music and being ethical was the drugs because once you get caught up in drugs that's all that really matters to you so he was not trying to rip people off you know what i'm saying he was just doing his thing with his drugs and and everything else went to the wayside but it was not done intentionally and it was not done maliciously on the other hand larry after going through this you know he actually went through this downfall with sly so for him to treat the members of Graham Central Station like he did was, you know, abhorrent because he did purposefully make sure that we did not get the monies that we deserved. We did not get credit on the songs that we helped to write. And, you know, he had us on a salary. You know, we we were on a salary, a weekly salary. In the meantime, money was coming in. You know, we were up here and Larry had all the trappings you know, that comes with having money. And some of the members of the group couldn't even afford to pay rent or have a car. Wow. So wow. That's, that's the that's the difference in the uh, band leading, you know, style. So, uh, it, wow. So in other words, so people might, you know, because Sly is well known his drug struggles. People might assume that he was like just horrible at being a band leader. You're saying that's not necessarily true. And in contrast, because Larry was inside that situation and he saw some of the problems that could arise, he should have known better. And, you know, he should have treated you guys better. Mm -hmm. Because everybody in Sly, all the members of Sly, they all had houses, big houses on the hill. Okay. They all had all the cars. I understand the difference. Yeah, the the 57 Thunderbirds and the Chords and the what you (laughs) name it. They had them all. They all had all the uh, all the breeds of dogs. You know what I'm saying? All all the Salukis. (laughs) So they had all the stuff because Sly was giving them the money. Right. Yeah. I never asked you this before. Did you ever? Do you know what Sly ever thought of GCS? Like, did he have any thoughts on Graham Central Station? He liked it or didn't like it, or no comment? I, or? No, I do not know. I don't have a slightest idea, but I do know that we had a, a gig, and I believe it was Washington D.C. and Graham Central Station and Sly and the Family Stone, and somebody else was on the gig, and I could not wait. I was so ready to do that gig. <laughs> DC, they loved you there too. Yeah, but Sly didn't show up. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> so, because uh, <laughs> I, I was really looking forward to that one. Right. So, but no, I, I don't know what he I, thought about Graham. I'm not Central surprised, Station. but I was curious. I, was, I just mm-hmm. thought about it. I was like, hmm, okay. Anyway, so you guys, uh, I was talking to Osha about this too. You guys had a, like a kind of like a real revival. A like show. I'm talking about Graham Central Station, uh, with the outfits and the audience participation. Uh, talk to me some about that. Like you guys would do the the acapella. We've been waiting and kind of go to the front and check everybody out, right? Just mm-hmm. kind of get the audience going. I, I love stuff like that. Tell us about that kind of. Well, f- 
it got to the point where, well, no, I think we did it from the very beginning. What we would do is we would march into. So if we were like at a big uh, venue, we would go and march from the back all the way down the aisle to the nice. stage. Or if we went a little club, we would uh, come and march come around and march through the club all the way through. So that's how you that's how we would get people involved from the very beginning. I love just that. marching through the club or marching to the through the venue or whatever. And um the music that we played was deeply infused with gospel music. Mm -hmm. So that gave the feeling of or a revival, if you will, or people, you know, getting um, you know, spiritually involved with it. You know, because funk to me is like um is like um, a gospel song, gospel music. It really is because yeah, of the way that it makes you feel and the way it gets you caught up and the way, like uh, like in Washington, D.C. and Philly and places like that, they brought the audience, they brought uh, tambourines and whistles and all kinds of percussion. Oh, the, the people in the audience would bring yeah, that? Oh, okay. instruments to the, to <laughs> nice. the gig. So, so they, they would it. be playing along with us. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Falling in the spirit. Mm -hmm. I hope they had a good time. So that would take it off. That would take it to another <laughs> level, right there. Can you imagine thousands of people with all these different instruments, these tambourines, and whatever else they might have had? I'm imagining it, and I'm getting jealous because it just sounds so, it sounds just so special and great. It was. It know? really was. It really was. And it's just hearing about how much practice you did, but then how, also how much fun it was. It's mm -hmm. just like. That's why I'm just trying to get people to understand nowadays, right, Jay? It's just right, like man. just trying to, you know, bring it back to the level. And that's all Bay Area. Yes, okay, so um the albums, because we really want people to check out the albums. How did how did the um cause I, you said it was like uh giving birth to a baby, the first album, the self-titled debut. Mm -hmm. First of all, talk about that um the album cover. You got the dresses in Berkeley or something? Okay. So the album cover. It's kind of old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, you know, at that point, we didn't really have any money, so we had to be very creative. So I went and got the dress, you know, at a secondhand uh, store over there in Berkeley somewhere. Yeah. And uh, it was really nice. So, and Larry and the rest of the group, the vibe of the dress, it was all like old-timey, you know. So we were at the train station. And uh, nice. in the background, you can see a, a little conductor man. If you look close, yeah. there's a man standing <laughs> in the background. So that's what we were going for. We were going for a vibe that that would be believable. And still, we would look like, okay, we really thought this out. Okay. Yeah, and this yeah. is what we're presenting to you. Got you. We're giving you this vintage old time, you know, true school type vibe. Right. So that's what that was. And it worked out really good. That was one of, because I know that we work so hard and everybody, you know, uh, had input on it. That's one of my favorite album covers. Yeah, I know you like you really like that one, mm -hmm. and that's I like how you point that out. Like with what you guys had, you were real creative with, and you want to mm -hmm. make sure people say you were serious. Mm -hmm. um, okay, the music. So was that recorded at the plant? Um, how long did it take you guys to record it? Did you just do it fast because you had those songs like so long? Or? Well, yeah, that's why I said it was like giving birth to a baby because we those are the songs that we were doing all those rehearsals. Like for months and months and months, we were rehearsing. So, you know, you carry something for nine months, right? And then when it finally <laughs> when, when it finally comes out, you know, that's like a birth. So after all those months, we we played in um, San Francisco a lot at this club called The Orphanage. Orphanage, right, mm -hmm. right. So Is that, we, that's where you got signed, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So after playing this music for so long and rehearsing so hard, you know, when we finally did do the album, it was easy to do. It was easy to do. The only thing that was missing was the actual energy, you know, because Grand Central Station was a very energetic, high energy group. But um, what we tried to do was just have everybody in the studio playing at the same time. That's how we would do to try to capture as much of that energy as possible. What are your favorite uh, cuts on the album, personally? That first one, I have to say that I, I'm in love with that whole first album. <laughs> the whole yeah, that's thing, my favorite. Through. Yeah, the uh, first one is my favorite one. Us too, as well. Um, was there um, were those like the main tunes in your set? Were you kind of sitting on tunes? I was, I was, I was wondering, um, preparing for this interview. I, did you have like songs in the cut that you put on release yourself later, or did, was that like a separate creation? Like, how did yeah, that work out? We had them. Okay. We just put them on there later. Oh, mm -hmm. okay, cool. So you mm -hmm. were playing. Uh, what, what did you already have, or what was held over for release yourself? Um, let me see what what songs were on release yourself. Let's see. You got release yourself. <laughs> okay. uh, it is your kind of music. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, Mr. Ryder. Oh, yeah, that was one. That was one that Larry had actually written all by himself. He had that already. That song was referring to Sly. Now, speaking of album covers, though, that that's not your favorite album cover, right? Uh, Release Yourself. But I'm talking about... Oh, because um, we were jumping up in the air? Jumping in the air in the... I think it's Sausalito in front mm-hmm. of that church. And then mm-hmm. on the back, you're like, you guys are all... Laying down, yeah, yeah, looking yeah. like we were dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that part. Yeah, we were, we were la- everybody was laying down on the floor, and the photographer climbed up on the ladder and took the picture down like that. Wow. And it, it was kind of morbid looking to me a little bit. Right, yeah. That wasn't my idea. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, okay. So... Talking about all these different things with the songs, let's circle back to that, okay? Mm-hmm. So I think this is really important to point out to everybody, so I really want to underline this. So I was talking about this with you on the phone mm-hmm. uh, before. So when you know somebody's in a band and you think they're a good singer or a good performer, you admire that. Of course, you love that. Mm-hmm. But then you think something even more when you know that they help create that. So if you listen to John Lennon sing, you go, I like how this guy sings. Then you read the credits and go, oh, he, he wrote this tune with this other guy, McCartney. Mm-hmm. And it raises what you think of that person, what you think they can do, what you think they're capable of. So I really think it's a robbery. And I'd like to point out like if you wrote a lyric, but then like you're told, oh, it's just a suggestion, and then your mm-hmm. name's not on the credit, much less getting that royalty. I mean, that's a that's a big gap in the record. So we want to correct that. So like, what are things that you came up with ideas for? Like hair, your verse in, in hair. My verse in hair. Uh, practically every verse that I sang, I came up with. So uh, hair. Then there was a song called Do Ya. Um, which is one of my favorite songs. Yeah, so it's, you did lyrics for Do Ya? I mm-hmm. love that song. Mm-hmm. And I can't think of all of them right offhand, but we, um, all of us did. Uh, the whole group, they all had input on the lyrics also. Wow. Too. So we. Oh, is that, we, is that really true? Yeah. Everybody in the group. Mm-hmm. On certain songs, we all had input on the lyrics and the music. Wow. Wow. So wait. Yeah, so, and the music. So. I mean, don't, don't, no offense, but you seem like an assertive person. You always tell me what you like or don't like. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like back then, were you like, cause it was, you were younger or like, yes, it seemed. Absolutely. Okay. All of us were younger. The yeah. whole group, Larry was older, mm. uh, you know, successful. Everybody was just glad right. to be around him. Mm. Just glad to just be in the situation. Yeah. So he took full advantage of it. Wow. He took full advantage of the situation and um, he just, we just didn't know any better. That just don't make sense to No, to it's me. not. But you know, it's, it's, you know, no excuse, you know, but everybody, you know, no, they started no doing that for a, a long time ago. Yeah. You know, black people have been taken advantage of for centuries. Ever. Should I say centuries? Yeah, <laughs> just you should. Ever. <laughs> let, yeah. me say, uh, let me say decades, you know, yeah. so um, it's nothing new. But you would think after a certain period of time. That people wouldn't want to do that to one right. another. That's what yeah. you would think, because they know it's happening. But and you know it's still happening right now. I still Truly. hear of people getting ripped off right now today. Mm-hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no excuse to still be getting ripped off today. Not no, today not in today. 2022. Not even for war. Yeah. Why? Why was there war? In Ukraine. I mean, who who still try to take over? Are we in the Middle Ages still? Exactly. <laughs> no. Exactly. So, right. You think people could love each other. So I just think people have to have that kind of spirit to yeah. be able to do it. Once money gets involved in a situation, mm. all kind of corruption starts happening. I have a quote on that. Um, let's see. On page 181, you're saying, at the height of our careers, the group members were making 350 a week. Jesus. That's crazy, Just right? barely enough to pay rent, afford transportation, or live on. In the meantime, Larry's lifestyle was escalating, like you said, including all the trappings of success. How could he rip us all off so blatantly was infuriating. Just before Larry left Sly, he wasn't making any money, but Sly hadn't set out to deliberately steal from them. Let me ask you something. Like, how... When did the relationship end... Um, where you guys were no longer a couple, like, is there a, is there a breaking point for when you like wise up to the situation and that? Where is it because you guys were romantically involved that you? Yes. Well, we were a couple for uh, about four or five years, and yeah. um, so a lot of things attributed to us breaking up. But the main thing was drugs, and the second thing was uh, domestic violence 
Larry was uh, violent. And so he liked to hit women. And so, uh, so I finally had enough of that. And I was young. If I hadn't been so young, I probably wouldn't have stayed in the relationship as long as I did. But I was young. And one of the main things is that, um, you know, I had gone through so much um, in this group, building this group up from, from us playing um, high school proms to playing all the major venues in every country. I mean, in every city in America mm -hmm. and then going overseas and all that. So I did, I had invested so much blood, sweat and tears literally mm -hmm. into this thing that it was hard for me to let it go. Right. It was hard for right. me to let it go. But I just got to the point where it just was not worth it anymore. You know, and I wanted to see what I could do on my own. Mm -hmm. And by the way, so I'm glad you mentioned that. And I wanted to underline as well. That, um, you know, this book is real and there's real truth in the book. So there is, you know, she comes real straight with all the domestic violence situations. She doesn't really sugarcoat it. And there's a lot of, lot of specific, like she said, like in general, that was the general behavior. Mm -hmm. And she, and she uh, mentions that a lot. There's hard truths to hear about your heroes, your musical heroes. But what's true is true. And um, you tell your story so well. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about, and somebody mentioned her before. Actually, um, uh, our engineer, uh, Gabe, is Gail Madro. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Gail and a lot of cats from around around here know her because she's a, a local fixture and people uh, people really admire her. She was young at the time, vocalist, mm -hmm. guitar player. And she, what was she kind of like snuck in as kind of like your understudy, but you two didn't know it? Or Larry brought her in the group when you were still in. Mm-hmm. And then she was in when you were out. So do you right. think, was that by design? Yes, it was by design. During the Mirror album, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It was by design because there was this, uh, they were they were planning, when I say they, it was Larry and his ma uh, road manager, Natalie. They were planning to, um, how they were going to get me out of the group. Mm -hmm. So this was their way of doing it. However, Gail was uh, Larry's mother and Gail's best friend. No, let me see. Let me get this right. Larry's mother and Gail's mother were best friends. Mm. So Larry had known Gail ever since she was a little girl. I see. So um, uh, Gail's mother also was a seamstress. So she made a lot of clothes for Larry when he was with Sly. And then when he left from Grand Central Station, okay. she made a lot of clothes for us. So um, Gail was always in the picture. Very talented, could sing, play her butt off. Very talented. Yeah. So Larry, at the time Gail got introduced into the group, it was like Gail is going to be in the group also. But that was not true. It was supposed to be Gail, both of us. But that wasn't true. So they got her in, and she didn't know. Gail didn't even know herself exactly what was going on mm. at all. She didn't have the right, slightest right. idea. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so she felt a, a way about it when it all revealed itself. But, you know, we talked about it later, and I told the girl, you did not know what was going on because Gail was younger than everybody. It was like she yeah, was just right. glad to be there. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it was a, a awesome career for her, you know, opportunity for her career. Why would you have to why would you have to be out of the group? Like Because it had gotten to the point where um some had to give. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we and we both knew it. Larry knew some had to give, and I knew that it wasn't gonna be long before I left. Mm-hmm. Although I was hoping that something would change and I could stay, but it didn't work out that way. Wow. Let me ask you um, a little bit more about music, because mm -hmm. I know we're going to get ready to jam ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I thought of? Um, so uh, talking about uh, getting uh, bummed out about the money, not liking the money. I think Willie Wilde might have been the, one of the first ones to right. say, okay. this." So he was out before... Um, Ain't No Doubt About It, the third right. album. Right. That's the one with the jam. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm thinking, I just realized, is there was there like a Willie Wilde version of the jam? Did Willie Wilde used to play the jam? Or did mm -hmm. that come? Okay. We played the jam from the very beginning. How wow. can we get a recording of that? Um, I have one. Oh, we got it. What, what format's it in? I want to say a cassette, but that's no problem though, right? Yeah, yeah, we got, okay. we got to digitize that. Yeah, okay. we do. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, I have, we I have plenty of tapes with uh, Willie playing. Is it? Um, oh wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. Is it live 
Or is it like in the studio or what, what, what are the recordings of? Were you guys like uh, rehearsals or? And I think that, that, that um, Scott had a poster of a Kizar uh-huh. gig we did. I think Willie was on that one and that's on YouTube. I think Willie played on that one. Oh, wow, 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 wow. At the Kizar Stadium. SF Snacks is what that poster was mm-hmm. called or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dude, that, excuse I me. I think Willie is on that one. Excuse me for saying, because, I mean, it's so classic and Homeboy on, you know, on the album is great, but that sucks, man, that Willie Wilde wasn't, you I know, know what I mean? Right? Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> because Willie was there from the very beginning. Right. Willie and Herschel were in the studio I mean, in the music room, just waiting on us to start. So they were in there just jamming. So they are the ones that so that's, actually. They're the ones that yeah, came up with that. Yeah. Willie, oh, wow. Willie Wilde and, and Herschel, Herschel Happiness, the exactly. jam. Exactly. Yes. Wow. wow. Yes. And Larry came in and while they were playing and he just sat down and, you know, started playing with them, vibing uh-huh. with them. And so that's how that happened. Mm. Damn. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Um, I'm so glad, I'm so glad all this information. And let out. me say this. I yeah. have to say this too, yeah. cause I was talking to Herschel. I talked to Herschel often. Mm-hmm. So okay. I had, I heard a blues song and at the very beginning of the blues song, it went doom, 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 doom. And I said, I couldn't believe it. So I, t- I, uh, I called Herschel. I said, Herschel. Listen to this song right here. It was a blues song. I can't think of the name of it right now. And so he said, oh, you think that's something? He said, here. <laughs> he said, listen to this. So he sent me another blues song, and it went. It did the same thing. It went doom, 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 doom. And that's what he and Willie were in the music room playing that day. And this song is a blues song called I'm Going Down. I'm going down, going down, 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 right. down. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how that whole thing started. Wow. And I didn't even know that. I just found that out like last month. Wow. Whoa. So Willie and so Herschel were in the music room playing that song. Then Larry came in and then turned to the jam. Wow. <laughs> wow. wow you so know deep. that song I'm talking totally. about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Totally. It starts That's out. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. It starts out just classic. like that. So you um you and Herschel are cool. Yes. Herschel didn't come on to our Willie Wilde episode. Right. You, did you ask him? Yes. Herschel is a devout Jehovah's Witness. Mm-hmm. And so he has <laughs> so totally separated himself from like he hardly has anything at all to do with music anymore. Mm. He's he's dedicating himself solely to uh, you know Jehovah. Sp- and the safe. ministry. He used to work at Safeway. He used to work at Safeway. Oh no, he lives in he lives in a place way remotely out somewhere in New Mexico. Oh really? He yeah. moved. He oh moved. okay. Because yeah, he, he to is live far out Richmond. somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. He just moved not that long ago. Wow, I heard. That yeah, he, he was in Richmond. Oh yeah, he retired. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. If Hersh will be watching this, I miss you, brother. He's gonna watch it. I told yeah. him about it. Oh, see, because mm-hmm. that's my boy. Who yeah, else? He's gonna watch who it. else you cool with? Um, nobody's left. Except that. for Larry, and yeah. we don't talk. So it's just Herschel. Like, Butch passed. Um, Willie passed. Sorry to hear about Butch, Yeah, Butch, too. Butch and Willie passed. David passed. Mm-hmm. So that just leaves me and Herschel and Larry. Wow, right. isn't that something? Mm-hmm. Isn't that something? That is something. And I miss him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. Butch, he, he and I went to school together. So I yeah. made the call to get him in the group. Yeah, let me. I was going to ask you about that. Let me just ask you about that now, since mm-hmm. you brought it up. So tell me about that. What was the group, Bobby and the Promises, that you? Yes, to? we had a group in high school. Tell me about called that, Bobby and the Promises. Well, Butch, he was a big Billy Preston fan. <laughs> he loved that. Was like Billy Preston was his like everything, yeah. and he moved like Billy. He played like okay. Billy and everything. And I met Billy. We used to hang with Billy through Butch because Butch was playing with Billy for a while. Yeah. So, um, so. He wanted to be, he wanted a group. So he was going to be Bobby. And so it was me, Priscilla, and my other friend, Jackie. We were the promises. So Butch could play the heck out of the organ, okay? But he couldn't sing all that good, but he wanted to sing. (laughs) (laughs) But he wanted to sing. So the promises would do the singing, but he was out front and we were in the background. So that's Bobby. I have a picture. And in that picture, um, Tony Maiden... And uh, oh, homeboy yeah. Bobby, 
Rufus? Yeah. yeah. They were playing in the band behind us. Right. Watson, wow. Bobby Watson, right? Bobby Watson. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, yeah. that's cool, man. Mm-hmm. That's wow. really cool. When did you stop the group? Um, what was the gap between when you you circled back and got uh, Butch for the uh, for GCS? Like, how long had you been apart? Mm, right after, shortly after Larry joined the group because we needed another keyboard player. Did he also move to the Bay Area? Yeah, he, for all practical purposes, he came and moved because uh, Larry had a big house, so he came and he moved up there uh, with us and. Um, Stayed there for a while. Left his wife and everything. Oh, she would she would come up and visit. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, he came and moved in, and cause we were rehearsing, like getting ready, like rehearsing was serious, and we rehearsed every single day, almost all day and all night. That's super Oof. cool, mm-hmm. super cool. Man, that's so fun. Mm-hmm. That is, so I would love that. Mm-hmm. Fun. So yeah, Butch had to be there so that he could. Uh, Learn the stuff. Yeah. Wow, he really wanted to be in. Mm-hmm. He did. He admired Larry. Mm-hmm. I, I bet. How couldn't I bet. you? Mm-hmm. How couldn't you? That's mm-hmm. that he invented that. And he know? was so glad when he got that phone call. When I called him, it was like, Butch, guess what? Uh, <laughs> you, ever, you ever heard of Larry Graham? <laughs> 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 We're about to put this group together and we need somebody. Wow. So, yeah, like I said, he left. He had a whole life in L.A. Oh, man. A right. wife, a right. house, yeah, yeah. all that. And he left it all and came. Baby, I wow. got to go. Mm-hmm. Tell you what, um, I want to we I want to talk to you about a whole bunch of other stuff, but we should just get some music uh, going and stretch out a little bit. Sounds good. To so me. let me ask you real quick. Tell us about the Rhythm King. This this is is this it? Yeah, that's is it. it. I, that's the F U N K box. This isn't like a cake you made at the cake shop. <laughs> no, this I, no, this isn't the cake. This is a real thing. The real wow. Thing. When did we start with this? Tell well, us about this. Well, we started with this when when um, Graham Central Station when Larry joined the group mm-hmm. and. I did not want to be just a chick singer standing up there singing and hitting the tambourine. I wanted to be a part of the mix, the tapestry, that funk tapestry, you know. So I told Larry, you know, we have to come up with something for me to play. So Larry came up with the idea for me to play that. And that was fine with me. That was right up my alley. So that's how I started playing that. One thing um, I didn't ask you, like how how long did it, well, you guys practiced all day long. So how long did you have to? How much work do you have to put into it before you really start to be like, hey, I like this? Was it right away or is it like... Yeah, it was right away because I wanted to do something so bad. Mm -hmm. So it was right away. Like, I couldn't even get Willie to show me some licks because, you know, it's a drum machine. I'm like, can you show me? So I had to figure it out by myself. So (laughs) my little solo, I figured out all by myself. (laughs) And by the yeah, way, yeah, he was hating. He was wow. hating, right? <laughs> he was like, "This, this, yeah. this gonna put me out of business." He's like, yeah. He saw the writing and on Willie the wall. And Willie was so bad. That boy could play the drums. Like he octopus. could play. And also, let me shout out his brother. He had a brother named Ted Sparks, who was also a drummer. Mm. Like when Willie first left the group, Ted came in right away oh, and pinched him. Yeah, I remember him. you told me that. And yeah, yeah and then then he played. After that, Ted got a gig with Natalie. Um, Cole and mm-hmm. played with her for many years. He wow. was also bad. Wow. Right on, man. Right on. Mm-hmm. Well, tell you what, uh, let's get into it. Dude, by the way, you guys, we had a rehearsal yesterday. That was an interesting experience in my life. And let me tell you something. That thing sounds good. It was just like listening to the record. Oh, man. It's just like, just like. It. I don't know why. I didn't really doubt it. It's just when I, once it was like, I knew she was bringing it, but once right. we hooked it up and like it was playing and like she was playing, I was like, oh my God, here we I go. I mean, anybody can play that, but the way she played. Yeah. Like she clearly has thing. it on lock. Yeah. I mean, until yeah. you actually play it's with her playing It's muscle memory. That, you know what I'm right, saying? I can tell you. Everything you just know comes right back. And I want to say about this machine too. Yeah, that, go ahead. Um, I left the group. And I did not take my machine with me, uh, but it was that exact machine right there. But I didn't take it with me. So Stozo gave me this. Oh, machine. okay. He gave Shout it out to, to Stozo. Bless yeah. you. Mm-hmm. Bless you. Dude, yeah. that, that's smart, man. Mm-hmm. And um, you are, if people don't realize that, I should say this. You are actually technically an innovator in just using this machine. Oh, I'm telling you. Who, who brought something like this on a stage live before her? Never. No one. We have to look. You know no, what I mean? Who, no who would that one. be? No you know what I mean? So it's just, we're just talking. That's what I mean. That's what I'm trying to tell you. This is the woman here, you guys. Yeah. I just made myself nervous. Are we going to play with her now? <laughs> I think I feel sick. I got to go home. 
<laughs> I mean, this is a, an incredible little thing. Tell that, you what, let's yeah. listen. Let's uh, bring the boys in here. We'll jam a little bit. I'm going to ask you a few more questions before we go, though. Okay. We'll come back and then we'll play a little bit too. Uh, we'll play a second song later. Okay. All right, guys. Sounds good. All right. All right. Let's do it.
God Almighty, that was something else. And by the way, you guys, um, I want to just make sure that we point out. So we got our brothers from the Funkonauts playing with us, Jay Stone. Right from the album, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was about to say. Okay. So Randy on the drums, uh, he's the man, dude, and it's good to see him. So he's on our theme song. Yes, sir. I can never be. What that means is every time you start watching an Ace Out podcast episodes from. Episode one to now episode twenty seven. That very first, that's our boy. So you didn't know you had a celebrity in here. Um, He also plays on, you know, fully mentalized. He represents on that. I remember when the three of us got that song together originally. Uh, We got that together at Soundwave. Um, I mean, Randy G plays on the song Planet Funk. Okay, he plays on. I mean, we're dispatches from Planet Funk. He plays on, uh, I think, Stay True, Some People. Uh, by the way, Osha, he's also on Funkin' He's played right. lots of Funkin' gigs. Uh, what's, is he playing What About the People? I know he's he playing, plays on the Bible. Yeah, he's playing on uh, a bunch of that stuff. I can't just tell you what it Ta- is right off the top of my mind. By the way, um, so Osha, we talked about him last time, but it, it got cut because it wasn't like we had a little problem with it technically. So I just want to point out, so... My brother was in Timex Social Club. Osha Vernon Savage. Osha Vernon Savage. Um, he is on, I pointed this out before, he is on the Boys in the Hood soundtrack, yeah, okay? Yeah. Yep. And uh, this dude is a just a cat, man. He, he's a gigging cat. He's played everywhere. He's done everything. And we love Osha. I told him I wanted him to get him back in because JW, he was like a real strict band leader of like how he um, designed that song. Yeah. So... Osha and I were like doubling the dun, 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 like right, the yeah, bass line. Yeah, so he just are. like he just told us, you know, you need to lock. It was all about lock with JW. You got to lock. So, you know, that we were funky as hell. But I was like, dude, you, that's not everything that my man can do. So I'm all, we got to have him back in again. So he's, he's ripping and roaring here with chocolate because he gets sure. to stretch out with that chocolate funk. You know, uh, one part, uh, Jay Stone, when we did the episode 11, right? right. The episode 11. Uh-huh. I was uh, preparing my little interview. I was getting ready. It was going to be the first time uh, interviewing Chocolate. And I was all proud of myself. I had this great idea. We're going to start off the inter- we're going to start off the whole show with I Can't Stand the Rain from uh, Ain't No Doubt About It album. And I was like, she would love that so much. I was like all proud of myself. I was in the middle of reading this book at uh-huh. the time when I was planning this. I got to the part in this book where she said that how angry she was and how much she doesn't like. She loves the song and right. they always did that song as a staple. Mm-hmm. The album version of that song was like, isn't that right? And yeah. oh my God, thank goodness. Dude, 
You guys have to do your research. Read your books because I almost had an egg on my face. I would have ruined the whole vibe of it. Imagine if I started it off with that. Uh, okay. Now, um, why is it that you were mad about that? Sorry, Jay Stone, what were you going to ask? I was just going to say, I, I, I have serious XM and I listen to whatever. Serious? Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that a remake? Mm-hmm. It's, well, a yeah. remake. it's a remake. Mm-hmm. And Peebles, okay. right? Okay, yes. Yeah, because yeah, I'm always seeing. I'm like, man, I wonder if Nari made that first or after. You know? No, okay. we. Yeah. So mm-hmm. the reason why I didn't like it is the the version on the album is because you know you know how you uh, sing a song, you just singing it down to warm up and you know get ready to do the real thing. You're doing like a so mic check. So that's what I was doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and he kept, and he kept it. it. Oh, <laughs> you don't know that. He kept it. And That's again, why I have always hated that, oh, and I'm, that okay. version of that song. First However, of all, let me okay, say go this. Ahead, go ahead. I do have a, um, when the group, we had a reunion tour in 96. And right. um, we did the song, where were we? It's Fillmore West or someplace east? Some, yeah. Fillmore, what is it? The Fillmore what? Yeah, West? It's yeah. Francisco and Fillmore okay. East from New York. Okay, okay. So we did, a, we did I Can't Stand the Rain, and I love that one. It's a live version. It's on YouTube. All right, y'all okay. check it out. Mm-hmm. Like check that out. Go to that one. <laughs> what I was going to say, <laughs> what I was going to say is I know when like somebody else, like Larry had to do a vocal, I know they didn't say, okay, you know what I mean? I know they no, gave no, it some time. Never, to make, he he right. did that. He personally, that was his call. I'm like, Larry, okay, is it time to do it again? Oh, no, that's cool. We're going to keep that one. Mm. I, I was so upset. So he chose to do that for whatever reason that night. I, I do not know why. Wow. But that was so, I was so upset. Yeah. Jay did Stone. Any, did yeah. anybody speak okay. for you? Anybody Was anybody else upset on your behalf? Or was no. this kind of. Did you know just when and, you record, um, you just be try, just trying to get through the whole thing. Try, trying well, to warm up. I'm sure she's just to, checking her levels. Then you listen Check your levels. It, yeah, and yeah. then you come back with that power. But then you, you never come got back. That chance to nope, do that. I never did. Right, and you know right. what You're not people put the power all the tell all the time tell me how they love that song. Right, right, and it probably just tans your you hide. Like, you don't even just like, know. I, you don't even know what I can You're like, that thank song. you. That's right. It tans my hide. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh my god. Oh my god. Just another. So person. that's why I like the live version that's so, on YouTube so right now because I was redeemed. There you go. There mm-hmm. you go. Well, right. I know that was a staple, right? You guys have been doing that song for a while. I love that. Yes. You, going we back did to Hot that Chocolate? from the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of thought so. Mm-hmm. Did you um, Did you choose that song? Are you Ann Peebles fan? I chose fan? it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I love that song. Yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm so glad that I didn't do that, though, because Jay Stone, <laughs> I was going to do like a whole motif around Ooh. it. She would have killed me. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, okay. Let's talk about after. So, like... You got a solo deal. Mm-hmm. First of all, they tried to stop you from getting a solo deal when you left GCS, right? They actually did stop me, yeah. So did you have something going with Warner Brothers? Right. Had a meeting, uh, had it all hooked up, was going to have a meeting with Warner Brothers. And um, somehow Larry and uh, Natalie got to him. And uh, at the end of the day, the meeting was canceled. And that whole thing was squashed. However... I didn't let that stop me. I continued to move on, and I ended up with a record deal with this company out of New York called T Electric. Yeah, and I was going to ask you about that. So initially, you were hooked up with um, a great drummer, producer, worked with Miles Worth of Herbie, Indugu, is it? Indugu Chancellor. Chancellor, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But um, at some point, they switched them out. Who who uh, who was in charge of T Electric? His name was his name was Jim Tyrell. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He since passed, but um, it was a brand new company. And what happened was, Indugu produced me. We did these four sides. And what did was, you guys envision you and Indugo? Like, what what were you going to do? Um, we, you know, I was going to stay heavy on the funk, but nice. then add some, you know, just a little teeny tiny bit of maybe a little pop stuff, just about that much. Yeah. But I was trying to stay heavy on the funk. So Indugu saw my vision, and when we did the demo um that's what we did so we took it to the record company they loved it but they, they did like it mm-hmm, okay but they didn't they didn't want indugu so mm. that was what happened there so what happened was i went to him i told him indugu i can't you know i cannot pass up this opportunity i've been this you know i've been waiting on this for a lifetime i cannot pass it up so we worked it out where the record company 
paid him for the uh, monies that he has spent while, because I was signed to his production company. Now that, now, so now the, al- the album did change. Uh, you weren't heavy on the funk on that album. No, I wasn't. So what, what was that process? Well, because they had a, the record company, they had another vision for me. They were trying to take me in a pop direction, like a Whitney Houston type direction. Is that know? why they got rid of Ndugu? Or is no. it was not related? Okay, okay. They just had their own ideas for who they wanted to produce me and stuff and how they wanted me to sound. So I said, well, okay. Um, I finally got my record deal. If this is the way they want to do it, fine. We'll do it this way. And then the next album, I could do it the way I want to do right. it. So the the record was finished. But before it had a chance really to get released, the record company went bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> so that's what happened with that. However, wow. my album in certain parts of the world, people, you know, have gotten a hold to it and it's become like sort of like a cult. A cult yeah, it wow. has like over in Japan and some parts of Europe. Yeah. Didn't they play the cut um on the radio, didn't they? Mhm. For a minute, yeah. one call I want to get next to you. Did you get write close to you, I mean? Did you wrote Did you write on that album? Yes, I did. I certainly did. Who did they pair you up with? Um uh a brother named Dunn Pearson. If you Google him, you can see he got he has so many accolades. I can't even, you know what I'm saying? Wow. Uh, so it was mostly him that he paired me up with. And I had all the best musicians in um, New York. I mean, all the best ones. And um, also the vocal support, um, Tawatha Aji. You know who she is with Tume. Yeah. yeah. She sang with me. She did she did almost all the songs on my album, background vocals. Oh, I didn't know uh-huh. that. Uh-huh. And a girl named Sybil. And um, so I had all the best of everything. It's, it's a wonderful album. It sounds wonderful. It's beautiful. But mm-hmm. the thing went bankrupt. So and the, this is during this period, uh, after GCS, you were involved with a lot of different things, a lot of different pods. Um, some things you're trying to uh, get together, like Just State, some gigs that you picked up. Uh, I wanted to ask you about a few of those um, like Bad Baby, that was a group that you had, right? Mm-hmm. Bad Baby, you came up with the name. Yeah, that Who was, was in that? shortly after I left uh, Graham Central Station. So uh, David from Santana was in that, mm-hmm. and a brother named Jerry Bell and myself. It was three of us. And uh, were you funking? What were you doing? What were you practicing? Um, well. That's interesting, the way, because David had a certain direction. That's why the group didn't really last, because David had a certain direction he wanted to go in, and Jerry had one he wanted to go in, and me, forever and always, I just wanted the funk. So we never could really agree on what direction the group was going to go in. So it, it didn't last very long. But we did go in the studio, and we did cut, like, about two or three um demos and um how harvey, can we hear those songs i have them on cassette and uh harvey scales you may not know harvey scales you may do you that yeah, name sound yeah, familiar sound he similar. wrote uh disco lady okay, oh, okay. so yeah, yeah. he he was producing us he produced us for a minute so but it, it didn't last more than maybe about four months that whole situation wow. but i have i have a promo picture wow. and demos. Oh, you, you, i didn't I know that you even did a promo <laughs> yeah we, we, oh. we were, we, you know we was gonna do some stuff real quick yeah. now, you're trying to say there were some musicians in the room and they were arguing about stuff i, I never heard of that before <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you about um music box how okay. about that? What was that? Okay, well, that was another group. That Okay, that was before Bad Baby. Oh, okay. And this group consisted of a brother named Larry Batiste. Have you heard of him? Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, Larry who Batiste, who worked with Clay Tovin. Mm-hmm. You know who Clay Tovin yeah. is? So the two of them, so wow. they were in oh Magic Music Box. It was Larry, Clayton, myself, uh, James Coffey. James Coffey, mm-hmm. yeah. James Coffey and two other people that is escaping me right now who they were. But everybody from the Bay Area, you know, because the Bay Area at that time, that's where the flavor was. That's mm. where all the funk was. That's where the magic was as Talk far as I was it. concerned. Talk about it. So, you know, I, I stayed up here and I, you knew, even after I left the group, I stayed up here in the Bay Area and just gathered up all the people that I knew. Mm-hmm. Do you, because you, you traveled all over. What would it be about the Bay Area that makes it special? Or what, what do you think it was since you, you assert know, that? 
I, you know, I'm not really sure. Exactly. I think it was the just like what the Bay Area, like how I call it eclectic. Because to me, back in the day, like there was no the the diversity. Like nobody was tripping. Everybody was helping one another. Right. Like we were all we were all gigging at the same time. Um, Grand Central Station, Sly. Even then, uh, the. Um, Santana, Tower Power, because Lenny Williams, he sang on right, the right. first Graham Central Station song. So everybody was just trying to make it. And a lot at any given time, you could come to the house and anybody would be in that music room jamming at any time. So it was just the feeling of... Uh, it was like a family, really. Wow. It was like a family. There was no competition. People weren't tripping. Everybody was high. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, it, it, it was just a fit. And, you know, they try to talk about pockets of funk in other states. And I'm sure that these people think that theirs was just as magic as right. I feel like ours right. was up here. Like okay. in Ohio. Uh -huh. and right. Especially, they always talking about Big Ohio. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, but... I don't it. think the Bay Area has ever been um, duplicated. The feeling, the music that came You're out right. of the Bay Area, I, I haven't heard it from anybody else. Mm -mm. Nobody else. Mm -mm. Hey, right on. And you know what? Yeah, you reminded me when you mentioned some of those other groups. You know what I never knew when I would be listening to Ain't No Doubt About It? And then that song, Warner Brothers Party, come on. Mm -hmm. I like that song, but I never, like, what is this song, Warner Brothers? Why, why do they do this? But... Uh, GCS was specifically asked to do that song mm -hmm. for the, a big Warner Brothers tour, right? With right. like Doobie Brothers, Tower of Power. That's little a trip. Feet, you guys, Little Feet. We mm -hmm. got Little Feet. I'm like, why is he talking about? But I didn't realize that. that I read your book. The, that was all the acts that Warner Brothers had at the time. So you guys they, went all over with that. Yeah, one. we went to we went uh, all, all over in Europe, and so that. Uh, song that you're talking about. Yeah, why did you guys get picked? That's so, that's so cool. And you know, they picked Larry to do the song. They wanted him to do the song. I guess they wanted it to be funky because at the, the very last gig we had, there was a party for Mo Austin for the... You Mo know, Austin, and, mm -hmm. yeah. And so uh, that was the official party song for the part, wow. you know, wow. for that function. And they did ask Larry to do it. Well, he's got that radio voice. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and... <laughs> and I have to say, this is one time he did actually do something because he didn't, you know, nobody else was around when he did this one. Okay. So this was one time he actually really did do something by himself. So you got to hear him that credit on that one? <laughs> <laughs> how and and yeah, it was valid. It was funky. Right. Yeah. I was going to ask right. you, how were the other acts on the tour with you guys? Was it all love? Was it rivalry? Was it whatever? Well... We would always come like they would always have us somewhere near the middle of the show because, you know, you had our little feet, Bonnaroo, Doobie Brothers and all that. So what I do know is that every time that we performed, like we could look over on either side of the stage and almost everybody would be there looking at us. Dope. I yeah. bet, I bet you. Yeah, almost all the time. In Cats school. from Tower mm -hmm. Power, Doobie Brothers watching and you guys. Then we, and then, um, you know, also that goes for the people that came to see the show. Uh, okay. Rod Stewart, Mick Jagger, wow. all of them, yeah, they came and saw the, yeah, they, they came. They I got a picture of Mick Jagger. That's beautiful. In my book, you know that, right? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. And dude, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You guys are getting props. And I was going to mention that um, in your book, you make a really interesting point. Uh, not to make everything about criticizing Larry. One other point you make that's really good is people in Europe, you say, and in Asia, like they really, um, they don't just like their music. They like respect African-Americans. Mm -hmm. Like, can you talk about that? Like, Yeah, said, they do. They still do right now. It's, that still holds true now. Mm -hmm. What's the difference or what is it? That well, the difference is that they respect the music more than than they do over here in America. Mm -hmm. um, they they just respect it, it more. They, they study... Artists that they really love, they study them. They, they they go back as far, especially Japanese people, they go back as far in the history of this artist that they can. Mm -hmm. You go over there, and if a fan is talking to you, you can hardly understand what they're saying to you. However, <laughs> they can tell you the, your whole life almost. They right. know every album you've ever been on, every wow. person you've ever worked with. And then they know all the lyrics to your songs. Damn. You know, and that's how they do in Japan and in Asia, and that's how they do in Europe. And, of course, you know that because, you know, uh, like 
Mick Jagger and Rod Stewart and Eric Clapton and all those. Who did they study? Yeah. They studied every blues every, musician yeah. there was. Those guys are steep. Jimi yeah. Hendrix, yeah. you know, so that's how they, that's that's that how they do. That's how them. they do. Do you know, did that bear out and like how people would like treat you when you were traveling there? Did, was there, would it be a difference there? Did yeah, it, because they had so much respect for you. So yeah, it did bear out. They, you know, the the fans are just crazy. They're they're crazy. I love them. It was always fun going over there to play. Wow. Always. That's because so they couldn't do enough for you. You know what I'm saying? Right, it, right, it was right. everything all right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They couldn't do <laughs> enough. <laughs> yeah. 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 They it was were geeking. great. I love it over there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. I want to ask you about, you mentioned it before, the Graham Central Station reunion. Okay. Mm-hmm. So um you were you started in Rolls Royce for a little bit in the early '90s, and you were mm-hmm. you were gigging with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, you left that. There was a chance, I guess, it came to get back together with the Graham Central well, Station tour. Mm-hmm. And I guess um, did uh, Herschel and Butch kind of help negotiate that or put you in contact with Larry? Yeah, Herschel I, did. When would be the last time you would have talked to him? Like twenty years before, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, so, like, what um, – this is very interesting to me, especially for all you guys, because we mentioned there was getting played, there was uh, domestic violence, yet you were like, I'm doing this reunion. So mm-hmm. talk to me about your thought process or why you think it would be important to do the reunion, not to say, like, um, I'm never going to return again, I'm never right. going to do it again. Like, talk about so that. So much time had passed. Yeah. So um, – Ultimately, for me, all I ever want to do is keep the funk alive. That's all I want to do. To me, it's all about the funk. So, so much time had passed. So, you know, I was in another space in my life as far as Larry is concerned. So I did it because I wanted to be a part of um, funk again like that in a real way, in an authentic way. And when Graham Central Station plays together... It's, I, you can't even describe it. So I wanted that feeling again. And I wanted to go to all the places where, like D.C. and all the places we were going to, all the places we were popular. And, you know, I just wanted to be able to feel that energy again and be a part of funk music again like that. So that that was the main reason why, because it, it wasn't for the money. Right. So that was the main reason why I did it, just to be a part of it again. You say it wasn't for the money. That's interesting, no. too. No. You know, I just... I don't know. I, I really admire that so much. Let me talk about the the how the gig went. I mean, the the tour went though. It sounded like it was some some incredible gigs, some mm-hmm. of the most amazing shows you've done, especially over like at in, the North Sea Jazz. Yeah, Fest. yeah, like, that's one of the most amazing gigs I've ever. What was done. so amazing about that? The fact that that was the first time I had ever performed in front of it was so many people I, you couldn't even see where the the people stopped. <laughs> wow. They just went into the horizon. <laughs> <Wow>. Yeah, <laughs> so so I'll always remember. That. Wow. Mm-hmm. wow. And um, so what was okay, this is this is really interesting, and I got a quote on this. What was the vibe? So you're coming back into this. It must have been like just so very no, all the years have gone by, but also like these guys, I don't know, maybe Stockholm syndrome. I'm thinking of like these guys that are in the group, like Herschel, like were they kind of like getting you informed of like what the group's like now? What what was it like stepping no. back in? Well, you know, I was I was kind of you know, I was a little anxious, wondering how it might be. Were like, those guys always with Larry? Like, did they ever mm-hmm, quit? Okay. Mm-hmm. Like, if anybody, like, if Larry was going to be tripping, like, how was I going to feel after seeing him again all these years? Right, right. But that first rehearsal, it was like that much time has passed. And then when we got on the stage and started rehearsing, everything just locked immediately back into place. How mm-hmm. much rehearsal before the tour? Um, Like about a month. What songs were in the set? Um... Jam, of course. Right. Hair, feel the need. Nice. Love and happiness. Ooh. Uh, uh, what else? Can't stand the rain. Yeah, I know you had can't stand the rain. Mm-hmm. But I, I want to read a, a quote about this on page seventy from the book. Um, okay. So this is um, before the tour. This is mm-hmm. the time I'm talking about. You say in your book, before we started. Larry gave a lame speech. (laughs) He said, although GCS had gone through many personnel changes, the original members would probably be the best box office draw. So the decision to reunite was made on this basis. I interpret that BS as no matter how many different people he tried to use, 
None of them could recreate the chemistry that only existed among the original members. There was only one GCS. We knew it and he knew it. So he could miss me with all that crap he was talking. <laughs> <laughs> By the book, guys. <laughs> so, yeah. um, talk, so talk about that. What was he trying to say? Like trying to save face? Like this is a business decision? or Right. Like, you know. Right, exactly. What I said in the book, like, okay, well, the reason why we're doing it, but it was a reunion tour. So how is it going to be a reunion people tour wanted to hear it. without the original members? Yeah. Right. So whatever else you're talking about, okay. <laughs> but we know that if it's a reunion tour, everybody needs to be there no matter what's going on. And if I can come back, then, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, um, so this is when, this is just when stuff gets weird, man. So... You guys were playing at the Fillmore. Uh, maybe it's the same show we mentioned before. So at one point, yeah, I think it, it was this. This oh come on, I can't even believe this. So at one point during the show, Willie Wilde and David Dynamite, who are still with us at the time, mm-hmm. this is in '96 or something. '96. They they're in there. They approach the stage. Right. You're like fantastic. Right. Here's here's my brothers. I think one of them even handed you a framed picture, right? Right. David did. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So then you tell us, so what did you think was going to so happen next? So we're up on the stage and we're singing and jamming and the crowd is with it as usual. And then all of a sudden the crowd kind of parts like this, you know, the Red Sea. Mm, yeah. And I see David and Willie walking up to the stage and, and I'm like, man, there's David and Willie. And I'm thinking to myself, I know Larry's going to call them up and I know they're going right, to play with us. Right. That's what I'm thinking. So I'm excited. Right. So they come up to the front of the stage and David hands me this picture that he had framed of just he and I uh, on the stage somebody took. That's and nice. so he gave it to me. So I'm waiting. OK, what's getting ready to happen next? I know Larry's getting ready to acknowledge them oh. and call them up on stage. And they were they sort of kind of hesitated and thought that was going to happen, too. Larry said nothing. He didn't even look in their direction. So they just turned around and walked back wow. off. Wow. Walked back into the crowd. What is the thought process behind that behavior, do you think? Is that like excommunication thinking? Like, is that like, you know what I mean? Like, if you're not in the flock, then. I did banned? not understand that. I don't know what that was. Was that like in the middle? Of the, like, did you have to perform for a while after that? Like, how did you feel? I, don't know. I, I was That's a I lot. was sad. It made me sad yeah. because I just knew that he was going to call them up mm-hmm. and they were going to play with us. So when that didn't happen, I was sad. And then I was pissed. And then okay. I'm standing up there though gigging, so I had to like come Ten. to myself. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so we just went on with the show. But right. I I I couldn't believe he did that. Wow. That's and you know what else? Because like you said, people parted, so people knew who was in they the crowd, knew. and then exactly. they witnessed that. Right. That's, and being on stage, if you've seen that, everybody's seen it on right. stage. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because they were right up front. They came right up to the front of the stage. Wow. So it sounded like uh, the gig, it sounded like a great tour, like really memorable. It was great that you came back. However, that money thing, that credit thing sort of rears ugly head. So what was it like? Like a documentary crew or like a live CD got made and yeah, you guys didn't get peace? that's what, what happened it? once again. And, so, <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't know anything about it. Next thing we knew, we were doing gigs and here these people are with cameras. And, and, Not you guys. We love you guys. And, uh, you know, recording and stuff. And we're like, and Larry never did say anything. So mm. we had to call a meeting. In the bus, it's like, Larry, what's going on? So he said that, uh, you know, he had made a deal with somebody and they were doing a, a, a CD, a live CD, uh, you know, and documentary type CD type thing. And we didn't know anything about it and we weren't asking anything about it. We weren't asking if we want to do it, if we had, if we were given permission to be a part of it, none of that. So uh, that's what happened with that same old stuff. And so shortly after that, the... Um, tour was over but it was just the same old shenanigans and you um (laughs) as you described in the book it sounded like it really got into a thing it did and you you became the scapegoat basically but Mm -hmm. you really tried to get you at one point larry was like calling you all like stupid Mm -hmm. you're like you can let him talk to you like that remember (laughs) you you tried to get (laughs) right Uh, in this meeting so i guess you paid for that larry was you know we were trying to talk to him about it and he was busy calling everybody stupid you know and uh I couldn't stand one more stupid, uh, and there was I was the only one woman besides Larry's you wife. Take one more so I had to. I was a scapegoat. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. I'm like, 
how many stupids are you guys getting ready to be <laughs> on this bus tonight? How many? That was on the so bus? Then, yeah, it was on the bus. So Larry, then he targeted me. It was my fault probably that we even having this meeting, blah, blah, blah. Mm. So that's that's how that ended. So I did not leave the tour on a good note. Wow. And, and, and you know what? It was probably, they probably just wanted it that way. They just seemed to have like something about you that they just have to make sure you have like a bad taste in your mouth whenever. I don't know what it is. If it's your, was it you have a strong personality? Like, what? Why are you rubbing them the wrong way like that? That's, well, it's just because, such a shame. Man. Because I'm speaking out. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, being young and being taken advantage of is one thing, but mm -hmm. 20-some years yeah, later. Yeah, yeah, you're like, yeah. 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 Wow. Well, I think that's really great that you did that. And then I also want to let everybody know, because it's just interesting that you say that it's just so important now. It's why you're here. Um, you haven't talked to the man in a long time, as I understand, but... Would you would you reunite with GCS right now? I would. And why is that? And I think that's cool. It, but that's surprising it, to hear, though. I would, it, for the sake of the funk. Keep okay. the funk yeah. alive. Yeah, just for the sake of the funk. Because, once again, the feeling that you get, you know, generating that energy mm, yeah. and, and the music and just everything, it's just... It, that's the only time I get that feeling. Mm -hmm. It's when I'm up on stage and the energy that passes back and forth between uh, the the audience, you know, and the band. It's like, yeah. it's the only time I ever, I've ever had that. Yeah. So if I can experience that again, mm -hmm. I would do it. And do it for the people, too. And mm -hmm. that's something to me that's very deep. I just want to make sure we get out there because, um, I don't know, I don't think anybody would blame you if... Uh, you got played one too many times or just you didn't want to deal with, you know, you didn't want to go back. And a lot of a lot of groups don't reunite. They just don't. Mm -hmm. People can't get along. I know I've held a grudge here or there. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. hard to do. And all the stuff you talk about, I just think that's amazing. That's amazing to me. And uh, I really admire that. And we all thank you for that. And I, I hope it happens sometime, too. I do, too. You because know what I mean? if three of us are gone already. Like we were talking about that before. Mm -hmm. So it's like. That would be a good thing, man. Yeah. That would be a great thing. You um, you talk about so many interesting things in your book. It's such a great inter uh, overview, you guys, of funk history and music history and interesting insights and well-written thoughts. There's one uh, part more towards the end of the book um, where you're talking about, well, around this time, like kind of like late 1990s, which I remember was kind of not a great time for African-American music business. And um, you talk about this time. You say, um, gigs started to slow down. I'm talking about the late 90s, Jay Stone. Mm -hmm. The music business was changing right before all of our very eyes. Authentic, valid, soul-stirring music was becoming a thing of the past. And that's what the head white men in charge at record companies were paying for. Uh, Back-to-school artists are hanging in there but only a few who work consistently can really make enough money to live on. And this is, this part really stuck with me. Promoters don't really respect the artists and don't offer the money them soldiers and legends deserve. Mm -hmm. Most of the promoters are white and have a take it or leave it attitude because there are a gang of acts out there waiting in line to be taken advantage of. And what's deep about that is we were talking about the Bay Area. In the Bay Area, people don't care what color you are. So it's not really about like a black thing, white thing, but you're just observing that some of these promoters, they have this like this cold attitude, this like take it or leave it attitude. Mm -hmm. And uh, people that, um, well, you're talking about how people are getting treated in Europe. They should really just be worshipped at least or at least paid a little bit better. Respected for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like as soon as like the tide changed with the instruments, um, so it did with the business. Um. What what did you think about that as far as um, that time and like stuff that you were working on? Because you you have done music and since then and past that time, like I love like with Wayne Henderson, mm -hmm. I love the stuff you've done. So like, how did you get through that or what was well, that like? I just had to, you know, I just had to reinvent myself. So I became that person that everybody was calling to do sessions with, you right. know. So I, mm -hmm. I stayed in the studio doing sessions. I was writing songs also. I worked with Wayne Henderson a lot. He had me working with, I worked with him steadily for about three years. Everybody he brought in the studio. I was. Uh, he likes that chocolate funk. I was right. Yeah, he, I was putting the funk on it. I was doing background vocal arrangements, um, writing songs, um, 
all of that. So it was good to work with him. But in the end, he ended up doing, you know, he ended up ripping me off too. That's another long story. Like songs that I had written with him oh, is that or right? for him. Mm. When the song came out, I didn't know that. my name wasn't on it. Oh. <laughs> He took my name off the songs. I did some songs with him with Ronnie Laws. I have a song on Ronnie Laws. I could go on and on. But anyway, the experience with working with Wayne while we were doing it was fun, but the business part of it was whack again, and he ripped me off again. We need so, to do better, you guys. Like yeah. if, if you're if Jay Stone writes a song, I don't say like, "Hey, I did that." You know what I mean? Let's right. why don't we let's give each other credit? We're exactly. all friends. We're all that. family. And money and money, money, you know legacy. Got to do that. Like yeah. I said before, people understanding who you are and what you've done. You know, you don't. You shouldn't have to do a deep dive to find out this stuff, man. Right. They did an eight-hour documentary about like Paul McCartney combing his hair, like on whatever that's on Disney Channel. It's like, okay. <laughs> but, you know, not everybody gets that type of analysis. You know, I get jealous of that, man. Right. So after that, after I was doing sessions, then I started doing, um, uh, I was doing a lot of um, demos for songwriters. I did that for a while. And then I started doing uh, what's known in L.A. as casuals, the corporate the casual gigs. gigs. Yeah, yeah, we were doing, I did casuals for quite a while. And that was, you know, that was good. You know, it was steady. It was good because they were just starting to, starting to incorporate black people into that. And so, really? uh, just yeah, starting. Just starting, and it was Motown. They wanted Motown. We were known as the the Motown singers. Okay. So I did that for a while. How did you get looped into that scene, or did you at least make good connections in that scene? Mm-hmm. I made a lot of good connections. One of the better connections I made was with this one girl. She um, um, turned me on to a session. She turned me on to a session. We well, we met on the casual. She had a session coming up. They needed somebody else besides her. So she turned me on to the session. And that session ended up being, uh, that's how I met Dre, Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre because right. he was producing this brother, this this guy named Jimmy Z, who played the funky flute. Mm-hmm. So that's how I met. I met Dre like that. And then while I was in the uh, studio with Jimmy, then um, Kenny Copeland, uh, the leader of Rolls Royce came into the session to talk to Dre because he and Dre were doing some things. So that's how I met Kenny. So that's how I got with Rolls Royce. Wow. So you hear all that? And mm-hmm. that's that's on YouTube too, you guys. Wow. Funky Flute. Mm-hmm. That's on YouTube as well. Well, gosh, um, you know, we're going to get out of here. Actually, we're going to play one more song before we get out of here. Okay. And it, it's just been so great having you here. Um, you mean so much to us. You've really helped us with the show. We're going to be doing future shows with you, as we've discussed. Yeah. Um, let me just ask you a couple, just like quick, quick questions okay. before we before we head out. Do you have um, a recording of? I know there was a group, Dynamite Happiness, mm-hmm. David Dynamite, Herschel Happiness. Right. Do you have any of those recordings? On cassette. <laughs> on cassette. All, right, all, all right. my stuff is on cassette but i have them though we have a I, compilation. I got about a trillion cassettes we got a compilation we got to put together and, oh I'm a, and i told you and I was you know what good on you out. for saving that and i'm going to yeah i'm going to i'm a person of my word how do how do they sound would you, would you, you think you could get something good with it i think you could all right because I, I think i think i really want to hear that i yeah. bet you it sounds great it does it's wonderful and it off to waste Cause they did yeah. like a sort of like a David. He did a, a lot of the singing, so they did sort of like a rock sort of type thing. It's nice. You'll hear it. Wow. Right. Yeah. Right on, man. I want to hear that. Mm-hmm. Um, what else I want to ask you? Well, is it true that one time you went to an Erica Badu concert and they played the jam? Yeah, they did. They played the jam. <laughs> she played the jam. Cool. I was like very surprised. <laughs> to hear that. You're like what? Yeah, I couldn't believe it. That, that was that she too. opened up with that song. Oh, they opened with that. She opened up with it. I'm telling you, people know that's the mm-hmm. main ingredient. Yeah. I love when that happens. I know, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was looking at a movie that recently got released. I think it was called something like The Saints of New Jersey or something like that. Oh, Saints of Newark. Yeah. Yeah, that. yeah. The One of the very first songs in that, the opening scene. Right, I heard that. <laughs> Right, right, exactly. right. In the Sopranos movie. Exactly. Right. I heard that. I was like, Psh. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's a trip when that mm-hmm. happens. That is Amazing. a trip when that happens. Oh, um, one more thing I wanted to ask you about um, the Kizzy kit. We were joking about it before, but I don't think we got it on mic. 
What is the Kizzy Kit? The Kizzy Kit is something I learned to put together after many years on the road, staying at many dumps. Okay, I learned to even in five star hotels, I've seen uh, housekeepers do some very nasty things. I've seen them. <laughs> I've seen them use the 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 towel that they wipe the toilet with. They wipe out the sink with. Mm. I've seen that with my own eyes because I was sitting there while she was cleaning the room. So I said, okay, I'm going to fix this. So now <laughs> what I do is I have a kit, somebody named the Kizzy Kit, that I bring with me everywhere I go. It is, it's really grown at this point. It includes a sleeping bag and my own sheets and my own towels. But it's wow. just, you know, everything to clean with, sponges, rubber gloves, uh, Lysol, wipes. And I've been doing this for years. And when I was in Rolls Royce, you know, I was the only girl. And so they would clown me bad when they would come to the room and they would see me in there cleaning up and stuff. <laughs> and so they would clown me really bad. Chocolate, look at what she tripping. So then, but before it was over, guess what they were doing? They were paying me to rent my stuff. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. Oh, chocolate. Can I use your your Lysol? Can I use your? Uh -huh, you you can. Course. How much money you got? <laughs> and I charged them. So that's what the kids get. Nice. Was. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> money. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the kids get. It still is. I have it today. I came up I, in the hotel I know you today. Did. I, I know you come me. correct. Yes, I, I didn't do. even need to ask you. Mm -hmm. Well, right on. And thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you have any parting words or any parting thoughts you want to shout out to anybody. Any I do. I just want to say, I just want to thank you. And I also talked to Scott earlier about it too and my cousin over here, Jay Stone. You guys are doing wonderful work. Right and, on. you know, uh, people, you know, the Funketeers, you know, they're getting up there. They, you know, they kind of drop in frequently like flies, really. So it's important to do this kind of work so that it can be a resource in the future so that Truly. people can find out what the funk was really all about from people who participated in it and created it and did it. So this is wonderful work. You guys deserve all the credit. I really appreciate <laughs> that you're doing this. Right on. That's, that's an honor to, wow, that was deep that you said that. I really appreciate that. It's easy for us. It's easy for me, even though I obsess over it so much and work so hard on it because like, I'm just so motivated to do this. Mm -hmm. I never think like, oh, I don't want to work on the show. Or I don't want to do this interview. Or I don't want to talk to this person. Right. Like other talk shows, they just kind of, they have a show. So they just have people on like this person's promoting this mm -hmm. movie or right. sometimes maybe the host likes them or doesn't. Whenever we have a guest on, you know, Guess to us, like each person is like royalty. And, and we can like feel one of the that biggest. too. It's so much fun. <laughs> I enjoy working with you. Right on. I enjoy nice working with you mm -hmm. as well. It's great working with you this third time. Wonderful having you here on the Purple Couch. Thank you to everybody for helping us. Thank you to uh, Don. Thank you guys. And um, on Facebook. What's that? Anybody that wants to contact me, oh, yeah, I forgot go ahead, to go say ahead, that. Go ahead. You can. Uh, you. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram, and uh, I have a um, apparel uh, website, onestopfunkshop.com. Onestopfunkshop.com. The number one. And uh, what else? That's yeah. Stop, that's about shop. it. Right Instagram on. and Facebook. Okay, that's it. I think I did everything. I remember she's a, a published author. Th and, uh, three books, right? And she'll give you a deal, you know, first one's half off for the Kizzy Kid if you need to borrow it. <laughs> you know, um, I just I also wanted to say you're, you're mentioning um, we keep men we keep trying to stick it in the show, but we haven't really had a place. So I think this might be a good time. Want to just shout out and give much love to Betty Davis. Mm -hmm. And she left us right. on February 9th. Um, you guys, you want to hear some great information about what it's like to hang out with Betty Davis. Please go to episode 11 of Aced Out Podcast. And our really? girl over here talks about uh, hanging with her, her putting mayonnaise in her hair and all those great stories. Huh. And that was great insight. And uh, that's another one that I had like kind of a fantasy. Maybe you could talk to her and get her on the show and we could. I you, know, right. We could be the one to bring her, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? So at least at least you, sh you showed us some of that and gave us some of that. Um, this is really great. And uh, you know what? Since I'm feeling so thankful, let's play. Thank you. Let's do it. Thank that. you for letting me be myself again. Rusty Allen's coming on next, you guys. Smell you later.
<laughs> Just like a rehearsal. <laughs> How was that? That was good. Okay, All right, good. now you can break down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. Harvey, are you ready for your kazoo solo? That's coming up next.